We are back and ready to discover the opera of the future. Hello and welcome back to Meet Mozart. I'm Angie, that's Mozart, and we are so glad to be back getting to share lots more information and music with you. As you know on this channel, we've spent a lot of time talking about different aspects of music history. We've discussed a lot of composers, different trends, the development of different genres within the worlds of classical vocal music, etc., etc. But none of those things would be possible without people and organizations that supported the creation of new performance experiences. And so today we're going to be joined by Eric Bagger and Stan Lacey, two of the eight members members of the Artistic Committee of New Camerata Opera and also two of its founders. I've had the great pleasure of sharing the stage with both Stan and Eric and they're both tremendous performers in their own right. But today they're here to tell us what it's like to run an opera company in today's world and also share with us all of the things that they and their team do in order to fulfill their company's mission of reaching out to new opera audiences. So I'm very excited to have them with us today. Please welcome Stan and Eric. Hello, Eric and Stan. Welcome to Meet Mozart. Hi, how's it going, Angie? Thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm very excited to have you guys join us today. I think it's going to be a really fun conversation. Um, I think it's going to shed some light into kind of the underworkings of the opera world and kind of how we put on these productions and, and also shed some light because I think a lot of people, if they've never been to an opera before, have this image of like this grand opera experience, you know, the fancy opera house with the crystal chandeliers and the really crazy high budget productions and stuff things like the met which you know i know we all love and appreciate but i think there's just so much more that's being offered in these younger opera companies that people just aren't aware of and you guys are such a wonderful example of how you guys are filling lots of different spaces and you're able to reach out to a really wide variety of audiences and um, you guys have some pretty special stuff going on. So I'm excited to kind of share that and let people get a glimpse into what opera is looking like in you know the 2020s. Excellent, thanks for having us. So um, I'd love to start with just hearing about how New Camerata kind of came to be. It's Eric's fault. <gasps> yeah, um, we had a uh, series of coffees. Yeah. He called me up one day and, and um, no, it was an email, I think, first, and asked if I, I might want to start an opera company with him. And I said, no, I would not, but I do like coffee. And by the end, he had talked me into this crazy idea. And I think he did the same thing with, uh, with seven other people. And that coffee was wonderful. It was like really wide ranging. It lasted a couple of hours. We talked about things that we loved about opera things that we hated about how opera was going in the current world, things that we'd like to see done better. And we talked about, you know, we're two and, and more than two uh, highly trained singers in this difficult world that we're, we, keep, we keep being asked to do opera for peanuts in New York City. And we figured, sort of figured, I guess, if we're going to get paid peanuts, we might as well be doing what we're really passionate about, what we really want to do. And um, we talked about what, are the, what those sorts of things might be. And, and it led to a bunch of other meetings and um, a famous moleskin. Yeah, the moleskin. <laughs> all, the, all the meetings got in there and we uh, then started meeting together, the, the, the collaborative group, and talked about, we kind of combined our personal ideals of, of what opera should be and what opera should be in New York City um, into a big conglomerate mission. Um, and that was to build new audiences for, for opera. And we determined that the way that we could best do that was through three branches. Um, so we had that structure from the beginning. That would be main stage productions uh, in innovative and immersive environments, uh, Camerata Piccola, which is our children's opera branch, and then Camerata Works, which is our filmed opera branch. Um, and uh, so that, that was the, the basis of, of that mission was the desire to build new audiences by making it accessible on all those different platforms. 
Yeah, and I think that's a really unique thing because, you know, since the pandemic, so many opera companies have become more available in like the video formats and things, but you guys were already doing that beforehand. So you were quite well set up for, for what was to come, you know? Yeah, it's a little tricky though, because one thing that makes video tricky for opera companies to do is that opera is already expensive. And then you throw video production on top of that, even though it's gotten more accessible in these times, more people have quality cameras and lights and stuff than ever before. But if you're going to do it, um, if you're going to do it, if you throw money at it, you can do something pretty well. And so we've seen a lot of the bigger companies who were not interested at all in video opera um, suddenly find a need to do it. And we've seen some really great uh, stuff come down the pipe. And one of the conversations we're having internally now is, so what's the next envelope to push on that front? So we've talked, we, we, at one point it was enough just to put opera on video because nobody was doing that. Um, what, what do we have to offer now that, that will help further that conversation in a meaningful way? Because I think when you're the small guy, that's your, that's your avenue, right? We, how do we shift the conversation? We have to do something different than what, what the larger companies do. Um, and then, of course, the the uh, the reward for that is if you do it well, that somebody rips you off, and you have to come up with another innovation. So that's that, that's fun, actually. It really is fun. I'm not. It's not just tongue in cheek. Yeah, it keeps you on your toes, right? Absolutely. Well, and I think that's a unique thing about the video recordings that you guys were doing was that it wasn't just like, okay, we're going to do an opera and we're going to film that and we're going to post that film on our website or whatever, or gives people like live stream access or whatever, which is what most companies are doing with, with the video aspect of their, their work. It's a live production that gets streamed or something of that nature. Um, but yours are actually like filmed and directed. It's all planned out. There's close-ups, there's, you know, you're not in an opera theater, you're outside in the world on real sets and things like that. So I think that was already something really interesting about what you guys were putting out there versus what we're kind of seeing a lot of now post pandemic. Yeah, and during the pandemic, it was, you know, the, 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 the lines between our three initiatives sort of became blurred because everything became virtual, as you mentioned. Um, to us, what a Camerata Works project was, was uh, we, would, we would record the audio professionally, you know, either with piano and, and voice or uh, with a chamber orchestra and voice. Um, and then we'd shoot uh, to playback, sort of as you would a music video. Um, uh, and yeah, it would be its own narrative. It gave us lots of opportunities to do commissions, um, which is which is great because obviously it, it costs a lot to do a new commission and to produce a new commission. Uh, but it, it when it's a smaller, you know, ten minute format, it's a little bit more palatable um, for a small company like ours. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's how we that was the routine that we kind of had in the Camerata Works branch. But then when the pandemic came along and we had to switch to virtual for everything, then we started coming up with, okay, what, what does a, uh, a main stage virtual production look like? Uh, we need to make it immersive somehow. We need to have some audience participation. So we integrated um, uh, the, the immersive tools that we found on Zoom um, to make it so that it was an entertaining evening uh, and not just another Zoom meeting for all of our, <laughs> our patrons. Um, we did uh, the Sluice Salon, which was an interactive uh, murder mystery, operatic murder mystery, sort of a la Clue. And the uh, audience got to, you know, guess who it was, who who done it. Uh, and then we did uh, the Brooklyn Job, which was um, a, an interactive operatic heist, where um, the characters uh, stole a painting from uh, the Brooklyn Museum. And actually, I should say, the, museum, museum, museum. the King's yeah. Museum. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, one of the things we found out really early on is that our audience enjoys us and opera in general much better if they've had something to drink um, and eat. Or we like, you know, people expect more than just the cost of a ticket for, for, a, um, for a performance anymore. They want a whole evening out. Um, and that's always been... Uh, one of the things that they'll find in a new Camerata opera performance, we've always found a way to offer that that um, added experience 
uh, at a show. And so thinking of how we could do that led to us loading cars up full of little boxes of goodies and drinks and delivering them all over the five boroughs to people um, who, who wanted, who, who uh, were willing to pay for that added experience and to try to enjoy a piece of that at home. And I really loved that part of it. I think my two favorite things that um, uh, about it, and um, Eric, you might have something similar. When I hosted um, the the Brooklyn job, um, which was it just involved me talking at the Zoom counter uh, camera, but there were several times during the night when I would field live questions that came in from the audience, um, and that was really wonderful because you miss that audience interaction so much when you haven't done live performance for so long. Um, and yeah, it's not as good, <laughs> but it's pretty good. And it, it, it helped, you know, it helped bridge that gap. And that, and, and you know, it, interacting with folks and being able to, to know folks were all doing something at the same time, that they're all drinking a cocktail together, that they're all watching a screen together and have some sort of feedback about that um, I think that was the really, that was the most special thing about this, those two virtual main stage productions, which hopefully those will be the last, last two that we have to do exactly that way. But we did learn a lot. Yeah, yeah we, we it was rewarding to hear. We got a lot of great feedback from our friends and family and, and from, um, actually it was interesting. We, we, we got some reviews from blogs that we had never, you know, they had never written about us before because one was in New Zealand, for example. So that was a, a kind of interesting um, pro to doing virtual content was we could open up our audience to a worldwide arena that way and get the Theater Times in New Zealand to write about uh, to write something about us. Right. Well, that was another aspect that I was excited to have you guys on and talk about because like, you know, this is YouTube. So mm -hmm. anybody from anywhere could pick it up and it's great. I think you've got a couple of your video offerings on your website, you know, that you can pay like a small fee to view or whatever the situation is. You have a few different ones, some are free, you know, so you don't have to be living in New York City in order to be able to enjoy these kinds of experiences. They're really, really accessible right now. So. We've got the opera works, which is the main video component. And then, of course, we've got the live shows. And you guys have really um, kind of done some interesting things in your live shows as well. I think one of the most interesting things is you have a really interesting choice of, of venue as well as repertoire. So I, I would love to hear about like how you choose a venue, what kind of things you keep in mind, and how you choose your, your repertoire for a season. There are so many factors into venue choice. Obviously, it's informed by uh, after we've decided what what programming we want to do for the season. Um, but both of those factors are decided upon by the artistic committee, this group. Um, we don't have an artistic director uh, or a general director. Um, we have this 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 collaborative democratic group. Uh, and all questions of venue, staffing, hiring, uh, and programming are decided upon by vote. Um, so it it keeps uh, it keeps decisions really, really well vetted and really thoroughly discussed before, beforehand. But the factors that we that we kind of debate uh, when we're choosing a venue, well, there are a lot. I mean, obviously, acoustics. Um, you know, sometimes if we're in a really, really crazy venue, uh, really non-traditional venue, I should say, for opera, we'll have to think about miking, which is always a headache <laughs> because there are always snafus, you know, technological glitches. We think about accessibility. Um, uh, not only is it an ADA compliant venue, but also, um, you know, how, how far is it from the train? Um, how, how accessible is it via public transit? Um, we think about value added, uh, meaning is it a will it be a fun venue to be at? Uh, what what types of drinks can we serve? What can we do to make the experience a little bit more immersive? Um, and yeah, there it's it's like it's it's unending. And and in in this city, um, there there are lots of choices for us. Um, but sometimes you know because we have so many so many check boxes, it it, it seems pretty constricting despite that. Um, I don't know, Stan, do you want to talk about programming? I just went on. Yeah. 
the venue. Oh choice. yeah. Well, we were still talking. There's so much that goes into venue choice, and uh, I think we'd we'd both be lying if we said we always got our first choice because in New York City, um, you know, the top venues are very expensive. So sometimes that doesn't fit the project for for whatever reason, mostly because we needed more money. Um, and you know, venues get very busy, so you might have. Uh, a director and a music director who both have a window of time. We're dealing with that on the next two projects. We have a window of time, and that's pretty much the only time this project can go. So we have to we have to go try to find a um, a venue that has a matching uh, chunk of availability, and that's that's not always the easiest thing to do. Yeah, but I, I think the main thing is we we're looking for what's going to make that complete evening out you know we've been in more conventional i mean for us conventional theaters like like a like a a black box kind of experimental theater space which is still non-conventional for opera but even then we like to be sure you know this venue what you know what are we doing in within this venue that is going to immerse the audience um we've we've done creative things with having to place the orchestra in the middle of of the uh, scenery because that was literally the only place we can do it um and and then we have the project such as i know you were recently at uh at cabin pag where we um where we had this huge uh former warehouse space to to work within but then the challenges there are when something is not a conventional theater there's an awful lot of theatrical things that might be missing so that, that there's that that sometimes creates more headaches more work on the back end um, and all of those things uh, play a part. And I think we learned something very valuable from each project that we've done. Um, and, and no two of them have ever been alike, even when they've taken place at the same venue. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like having those challenges come up against you that you don't have the usual theatrical things to rely on has actually presented you with an opportunity to find ways to make things more um, uh, what was the word we were just saying? <laughs> more like integrated or getting more audience participation. Like for example, the the Cavalieri uh, Pagliacci. You know, singers were singing from the back of the of the house or in the middle of the aisle or whatever. That it was a more interactive experience for the audience because you couldn't just keep everybody up nicely in you know the the stage area. Absolutely. Yeah, there was one uh, review that said it was verismo as if performed in your own living room, which, yeah. which I found interesting because most of us don't have 8,000 square foot living rooms, but it's verismo and when it's, when it's that much in your face, um, you know, it, 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 it really impacts you, it's really powerful because that art form, you know, was, was made for, for these big houses, for, for a more traditional proscenium spaces. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of like spinal tap. It's turned, everything is turned up to 11, you know? So when, when it's put in a uh, com com comparatively speaking, smaller venue, like 8,000 square feet with our um, more immersive uh, setting as well, it's almost like dialing it up to 15, you know? <laughs> it's, 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 and that is really something, you know, it's, it's, it's particularly something, I think, uh, when you're coming out of the pandemic and the only, you know, live performances that you had access to prior to that for the last 18 months were, you know, through the computer. So um, it was pretty exhilarating to, to give the audiences that, that hit, you know, that operatic cultural um, excitement um, that was so, so very tangible. And on the performing side of it and the producing side of it, it was, uh, just as rewarding for us, if not more so, to to produce this and to receive the the feedback that we did. It was a uh, that was a great return to the theater. Yeah, and there's a, an, another part of it too is is that um, you know I, I always think that the the doom and gloom sayers for classical music um, overstate their case, and they have for a very long time. But there is a you know, they, they talk about an old, older audience, but that kind of belies the fact that most people get into classical music in their adulthood. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of trends at work, and I don't think classical music is in danger of death at all. 
That doesn't mean we shouldn't be innovative and forward looking, however. And I think when opera was born, the proscenium stage was just a fact of the theater. And that's that's what you, there was no theater that, that didn't happen on, on those grand stages and largely removed from the audience by great distance. And then, you know, with opera, even more so than theater, because you have a, an orchestra pit and you put the players and the singers even further away. But that's not the only way that we consume theater anymore. You know, small houses have been a fact of life in the United States for a very, very long time. And then, you know, in the 20th century with the advent of, of experimental theater and, and um, the, small, the small intimate venues, opera needs to have its place in those venues too. It's very important, I think, for the continuation of the art form. There are more uh, small scale chamber pieces being written uh, these days. And I think that's a very good thing. Most companies, most small companies don't have um, the ability to program say Carmen the way it was meant to be done with 65 or more players, a full children's chorus, a full adult chorus, you know, 20 foot tall uh, sets on a, on a proscenium that's not the way it's going to be performed most of the time. Um, and that's okay. Uh, you know, the, the reasons to do it are more than just budgetary. The reasons to do it are because it's exciting and it's attracting new people who find that old way of doing things off-putting. So there's a home for the grand opera and, and we know exactly where that is in New York City. There's a home for um, this intimate and immersive brand of opera in New York City too. And that's New Camerata Opera and some others. But, but a lot of smaller, exciting companies in New York City that are, are doing things in different ways, in different places. Well, I think that was um, an interesting thing that, you know, that Eric brought, brought up with this being back in person again in this other space mm -hmm. and being more interactive was that the particular performance we're talking about was your CAV at plus PAG uh, performance, which for those of you that aren't familiar with these pieces, Traditionally, Cavaliere Rusticana and Pagliacci are two one-act operas that get performed in their fullness on either side of an intermission. And so what happened in this particular version was that uh, we took, they took basically the highlights from each production and made one through storyline so that you had, I think it was what, an hour or an hour and a half long? A 90 minutes. About 90 minutes. 90 minutes, yeah production that combined these two works that traditionally do get performed together, but not simultaneously. And so to really jump back into it and have this kind of quick experience that was also, you know, just one highlight, one well-known piece after another. So you're you're really getting like the, the best moments of both shows in like a quick succession after you know this year of no live performance was really just like a, a really interesting way to dive in and i think that's another way that in your main stage stuff you're finding ways to bring in other audiences as well it seems like you do a lot of stuff that you know kind of has roots in these traditional opera pieces but that also kind of expands on them, explores them in different ways, or presents pieces that people are maybe a little less familiar with by well-known composers. So it, it all kind of comes together in this really interesting way. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the reasons we did the 90-minute adaptation of uh, Cav and Pag, um, and when I say we, I really should be talking about uh, John De Los Santos, who's the director, and he was the one who adapted the, the libretto and uh, Sam McCoy, conductor and music director, who uh, arranged it uh, along with the help of Corey Ellison, the dramaturg for the production. It was, it was also a, a safety concern. We, we didn't want to do an intermission and have too much mingling inside the space. We wanted people to, to come and then, you know, see the, see the show and then, you know, uh, leave. <laughs> Only because we didn't want so many people within a confined area for so long. We did serve drinks and things like that, but fortunately at, at our venue, they, they had a backyard. So we were able to do that out uh, under the stars. Um, it, was, it was for that safety reason. And it was also, um, yeah, for some of the points that you bring up that we wanted uh, these pieces to become 
we wanted them to be as as we wanted them to be accessible, not watered down. We wanted the full impact of these these two incredible pieces uh, there, but we wanted to tell a slightly different uh, uh, story. Yeah, and to have have a lot of impact. And another thing, it, it you know, to show folks that we're listening. I mean, what is stereotypical complaints about opera? They're too long. They're boring. Well, I promise you, you pack two uh, action-packed uh, hour and ten-minute operas into the space of one ninety-minute piece. Uh, there's very there's there's no shoe leather. Uh, it 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 goes by really fast. And the last the last bit of the opera was certainly action-packed. And I think that that's very exciting. Um, I, you know, when we when we when we look at pieces, we typically choose things on the shorter end. I. I don't think you'll ever see a three hour opera out of New Camerata Opera. Um, it just, it's, it's one thing that, that's true. People like their entertainment in a little bit shorter bites these days. And we should, we should do that. And that, and that may mean different things in different contexts. That may mean uh, cutting um, a beloved classic opera. It may mean commissioning new pieces that are of smaller scales. Um, or looking at things in different ways like we did with Cabin Pack. So that leads us into kind of like the repertoire question. So like what kind of things are you guys taking into account when when you're choosing these pieces? What's your like, you know, your checkbox of criteria and all of that? If you have um, <laughs> I think we do have a literal checkbox that um, that Scott, one of our colleagues, worked up. One of the things about opera is that the, the repertory was was frozen. I mean, it's starting to, to not be that way as much anymore. Like companies are taking more risks, but there was a time when the most pro programmed opera in the world every year would be Carmen and the next most programmed would be Bohème. And, um, and you, just, you just knew that. Um, and I think we're still more or less in that world, but you can see it starting to shift. So um, one thing that we've done is we've made a, a tangible commitment um, not to program only the works of old dead white men. So you will never see a season of New Camerata Opera that in its entirety has programmed works of old dead white men. Love those guys, but you're not the only game in town. And for the repertoire to truly evolve, it needs to grow and encompass um, women and people of color who've been writing things as long as music has been being written and new and exciting composers that are working today. The other thing is, and, and because our, our organization is a, based upon this performing ensemble, um, we, we, do take the, uh, we do take that into account as well. You know, are there roles within the operas that we program that are appropriate for uh, the folks within this ensemble? Uh, will people in the ensemble have the opportunities that they need, the stage time that they uh, need as well? Um, but in addition to that, we also think about opportunities for singers outside of the ensemble. There's, there, there aren't that many operas that you can cast with just these eight specific singers that we have in the committee. Um, there was one, and in fact, it was a, a new commission. It was Divide Light by Richard Marriott, which we did in uh, the spring of 2018. Uh, and that was uh, custom tailored for uh, the group for the, 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 these eight singers, um, and it was incredible. Uh, and then, and then, as you as we've discussed a lot today, Cabin Peg, uh, which because it was it was double cast and it was the principals from both operas, so it was twenty something singers, um, and that really gave us opportunity to include a lot of folks from outside of the committee. Um, and what's ironic is that the folks within the group. Uh, did sing, uh, you know, much larger ego satisfying roles than say in Divide Light when it was just the eight of us, which was essentially like glorified chorus singing, you know, it was, it was, it was an ensemble based piece. Um, and then, then there are other, other things that we choose to program where uh, maybe just one or two of us are in the cast, um, you know, like we did El Barbero de Sevilla, uh, which is a sarsuela. Um, and it was over 50% of the cast was uh, native Spanish speakers. That, that particular element in terms of programming is kind of flexible. Uh, we do have this group of performers who like to perform 
but we also realized that we want to give other performers opportunities and we also realize that not only do we want to we need to yeah well i think that's an interesting balance that i've seen in the productions that you guys have done is that there yes there are these core you know founding members and things like that and people that are deeply involved with the company um, in other elements, not just in in performing, but then you also bring in other singers, and it's it seems like once someone does a show with you, they start to like get integrated into the group too, which is is great proof of having a really good you know working dynamic for the singers. Yeah, I mean we like to auditions are really challenging because you can tell if somebody is a a good performer for that aria that that you've heard them sing. You know, you can tell if they've embodied the character for those f five to seven minutes, um, but it doesn't tell you that much else about how they are as a collaborator, as a colleague. Um, so one of the reasons why we rehire folks that we with whom we've worked in the past is because we know them to be good colleagues. We know them to be part of the family, essentially, um, and and we really like working with them. So. Um, and what's what's really great to hear and to witness is is when when singers come back and want to keep working with us because it means that something's being done right in terms of the administration of the company like something the way rehearsals are being run you know the way that singers are being treated um, something makes the singers want to return and so that that as an administrator that means a lot to me personally yeah definitely and I think you know at it's also telling about the projects that we do, that we're doing things that um, matter to singers and, and that they they like to see on stage and they like to be a part of. Um, and, and that it's a, it's a huge compliment. Well, I'm always a little bit blown away when anybody accepts one of our contracts. And then if they accept another one for another show, I'm like, really? Great. <laughs> I mean, not quite, but the, 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 the idea that somebody would want to do these these things that we're, we're that we're that we're working on so hard is um it's it's incredibly gratifying and and I just am always um, happy to have those people around. I should note, however, that we don't want this this family that I mentioned uh, to stay a closed family. We want it to to be continually growing. Um, we want to always have our ear to the, to the ground about um, singers with whom we would like to work. Um, when it's appropriate, when we have uh, a, a role that's that's right for them, um, and we do, do auditions, and and we have done, and we and we will we will do in in the future as well. But yeah, it's it, it's true what you said, Eric, about the, the being a of limited value. I, if somebody blows us away in the audition, the next thing I'm going to do is ask everybody I know if that person is is a good person to work with, because we've all been, I think, in rehearsal rooms where the dynamic fell apart, where the wheels came off, either because a singer was was pulling tantrums and antics or because a stage director was or wherever the loose piece is, man, that's just my least favorite thing. Well, I think that's an interesting thing. And if you don't mind uh, talking about it a little bit more, I, I think people probably have questions about that is like, how do you as an opera company manage those situations whenever someone's you know really difficult to work with and um, maybe making things you know tricky on the production end you know one thing that that is a strength of our structure is that there's a a big group i don't ever have to speak as stan in that sort of situation when it gets to be um, a, a problem we can say put the weight of of, of the group behind it the artistic committee discussed this. Uh, New Camerata Opera wants to communicate to you that this is inappropriate or, or that that shouldn't have happened and we want that to be better. And, and also that, that's the same thing when it comes to mea culpas. Um, in, the, in, the, in Cabin Pag, we had, um, I mean, goodness, the, the, mounting an opera in the middle of a pandemic uh, is tough enough, but I don't know if you remember August in New York with, when we were in the middle of these rehearsals, um, we had a, a hurricane, the remnants of a hurricane blow through. It wasn't supposed to be much, and then it wound up being a disaster. Well, we had a, uh, we had a rehearsal going that night, and we had you know, a stage director and a music director who really wanted to go on with rehearsal. They are not to be faulted with that because that is their job. That is the position they should advocate for. And we had a situation which 
the, the rain looked to be a lot worse than it was. And, and so that led to a situation where the artistic committee members who were there gathered together and made the call that turned out to be the absolute right one, which was to try to get to end the rehearsal, get everybody home uh, safe. And so that's the sort of thing where, where if you were on an island, it might be a more difficult call to make. But we have, um, we have a bit of, of strength in numbers there. That, that helps us navigate those minefields, I would say. Well, yeah, and I'm curious to know, because you're, you're in a unique position, you know, a lot of companies do have like general or artistic directors who like have the one person who has the final say and everybody else is kind of like working to make that happen. But because you have so much more of a collaborative approach, I'm sure that is also something that has to be navigated quite frequently. And I know you mentioned like you guys have votes and things like that. But how much is everyone's input um, a part of each little piece of the puzzle when putting together this production? And sometimes it can be frustrating. I mean, there, we can we can agree to disagree about a lot of things. That when when people get very passionate about something, it can get um, trickier. But I think that um, we're in a, a rare kind of group where everyone cares uh, very greatly about everyone else, and and that's. Uh, forged not only of of the the normal kind of bonds of friendship, but also of the stresses that we've had to endure together, putting on all of these crazy productions, um, has has really made us a very close knit group. I think everybody has had a vote not go their way, and had to sort of toe the line afterwards and just live with it and deal with it. And and we do, and I think that's a a great strength. I'll also say, I've, I've said before, I think in interviews that I'm stunned at how often our decisions are unanimous. Certainly not all the time, but a greater percentage of the time than you would probably imagine. Um, we're able to get on the same page before it's time to, to, to cast the vote. Yeah, the, the, the group, because it was, it was structured around individuals who have a lot to say about the operatic field and have a lot that they want to change about it. Collectively, we have a lot to say to one another about opera. So we have very long meetings and we all like to talk and discuss. Um, and yeah, sometimes we butt heads. But um, what I respect about my colleagues within the group is that um, there's a great way, that, uh, people have a great way of wearing you know, their producer hat and then their friend hat, you know, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll talk right up until the end of the meeting. And, you know, something might get a little heated because one person feels um, this way and the other person feels that way. But then, uh, you know, well, we got to, we'll, let's drop this. We'll pick back up on Slack or at the next yeah, let's meeting. Let's go get some, let's beer. go get a drink, you know, <laughs> again, the drinks. <laughs> I knew that was coming in. I was like, this yeah. is where the drinks come in handy. Yeah. <laughs> it's the glue that holds this organization together. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We should all have, you know, a glass of something in our hand. Yeah. We're, we're doing it wrong here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is, this is gin. Yeah. This is my, nice, <laughs> my, noon, my noon time gin. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And so, so, okay, so we've covered the two out of the three pieces of the new Camarada puzzle. And then the third one is of course the outreach. Yeah. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Like, I know you've got a couple different operas that you're offering and I think it's mainly in a school setting, but how does all of that work, et cetera. So we're, I think we're up to four productions that we can offer um, for school kids for various ages, everything from 18 months up to 18 years old. And we have um, uh, now one virtual opera with six uh, separate episodes. Uh, that's Party at the Opera. And it was based on one of our uh, live productions first. I, Eric wrote that one. Um, we, yes, we do perform at schools and libraries and those sorts of venues. Um, Oh, that's a really, I think, special thing about the organization. I would say this just, just so you don't think we're all, you know, uh, altruistic do-gooders all the time. I do think that we thought in a very real way that uh, programming children's opera would be kind of our, our golden meal ticket. Like at the beginning, we thought, oh, everybody will love that we're doing performances for kids. And what's funny is it, it turns out they do. They do, they really love it. And they all say it's wonderful, but it's very seldom that we have a donor give us a check just for the kids opera. They're more interested in the other things that 
we're doing. I'll say it is our first foot in the door for a lot of people. And it's something that lets them know that the company has, um, has a big heart. One thing that we like to say too, is that the kids are not like the audience of the future. They're also our audience today. So um, we've put a lot of effort into developing projects that really speak to the kids to uh, where they are, you know, their, their level of understanding. So it's very audience uh, participatory, uh, especially party at the opera, you know, the kids get to play along and conduct um, uh, and, and it kind of grows up with them as we, you know, as we get into the pieces for older elementary school kids or even middle school and high school kids. And we were able to pivot uh, with respect to this branch as well um, to virtual programming. We released, we had had the, the live uh, Party at the Opera uh, production. Uh, what we did is we basically expanded that into five further episodes. So, um, and we, we went into, um, we had the same four characters, Sally Soprano, uh, Mildred the Mezzo, Tenor Ted, and Barry Baritone, uh, sort of be the, 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 the hosts throughout the, the, the series going through, going even further into in depth about the basics of what opera is and um, what opera can do. And it also gave us an opportunity to uh, introduce uh, the, the audience to, to, to more types of operatic professionals. We, we actually had one episode that uh, discussed production designers. Uh, so we, we hired an actual lighting designer, an actual uh, set designer and an actual costume designer to come and play the play themselves uh within the context of that little opera um and teach the kids what what that, that it's not just the singers on the stage that make up an opera uh we had another uh episode that went into what a stage director does and we had um our colleague jennifer wilson who's directing barnum's bird this spring come in and uh perform uh the role of um the director, which was which was a lot of fun. That was beautiful, bravi. If you don't mind, I have a few suggestions to make that'll make your performance even better. What? How could it possibly be better? We sang it so perfectly. Yeah. What's the big idea? I love that idea of the party of the opera and showing kids stuff that is not just the singing, right? Because that's what everybody thinks about, but that there's all these other elements. And I think that's a really great idea because I think, you know, not every little kid is going to connect with wanting to sing. That's mm -hmm. not everybody's thing, you know, but, but seeing like, oh, but then there's this job and there's that job and like all these people with all these different talents coming yeah. together to put this on. I think there's so many cool ways to like really let kids like connect on their own level, depending on who they are and what kind of things they really love. So I have a friend who's uh, an artist manager. He's doing pretty well these days. And I know he's gone back to like university settings to tell kids, um, kids, in this case, college age kids, uh, about um, about the opera world and what they're going to find out there, and they probably are all sitting in you know the choir room or wherever they are at their undergraduate university, as I did when I was 19 years old, dreaming that I was going to be Luciano Pavarotti, and knowing somewhere in my mind that that seems a little bit unlikely. Like there's really you know there's there's two or three generational stars at a time, and then there's there's you know. 500 people or so who make a great living flying around the world to different opera houses. And then there's like the working class singers that you're like, wow, there's so many people getting music degrees and so few of us are gonna make it, which I like to put in quotes, make it doesn't mean what it used to mean to me. And his, his take too was that there's no shortage of jobs in opera, it's just, that not all the jobs are Luciano Pavarotti's job, you know? Um, this, we're talking about uh, several billions of dollars a year spent on opera in the United States of America and opera houses that employ stage hands and uh, lighting technicians, electricians, um, there's lighting designers, there's directors, assistance directors, there's uh, 
there's a, a rehearsal pianists, the core repetitors, there's, um, there are myriad jobs in opera. If, and if opera is something that you're passionate about, you can work in this field. There's a lot of things to do. Um, it doesn't have to be a dream that you have in your mind that you, you either make it or, or you don't. There, there are a lot of different ways this path can, can look. I don't think, I don't want to speak too much for Eric, but until five years ago when this idea uh, came along, there was no way that I thought artistic entrepreneurship was going to be a path for me. But then all of a sudden, um, you think about things a different way. And I had um, uh, a young baby at home and life looked very different than it had looked. And um, all of a sudden, it's the only path that I would choose. And so everybody's path and journey looks different, but um, opera is a big and diverse field and it's, it's getting more so. So um, if anybody's watching this YouTube and wondering if there's a place for them in opera, there is most assuredly a place for you in opera, especially if you have something uh, unique and beautiful to contribute. I mean, we wanna know about you. We wanna hear from you. Absolutely. I echo that 100%. One of the, one of the coolest new projects that we have on the docket is a collaboration, the first time collaboration for Camerata Piccola and Camerata Works. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new commission um, from uh, Hannah McDermott, who's a librettist, and Hilary Purrington, composer. Um, and it's called One Train, and it's a 10-minute opera that's going to be animated by Ian Bronner. Um, it's, uh, it's about a little girl who's on the subway, and basically she interacts with uh, a number of folks that are also, you know, riding into work that day um, while she's on her way to school. And she learns that everybody has a, their own story. Everybody, you know, has their own secret and truth. And uh, it's a, it's, you know, Hannah shared the first draft of the libretto a number of months ago. And it, it's hard to read without tearing up. <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be really special. Um, and our, sure. our, our first ever animated opera. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Wow, that's really cool. And, um, and in terms of the, the kids show, I just, I have to ask the question because I think people would, would care to hear. What's the most interesting feedback that you get from the kids? With Peter Rabbit, we particularly have a, a fairly involved talk back that leads them to answers about what the moral of the story is, what the, how the music makes them feel. And one thing I enjoy is that, um, you know, the, the score for Peter Rabbit is all ripped off uh, from Donizetti's uh, Le Vizier d'Amore. And the music is, um, I don't want to say trite, that's under talent selling what it is, but it's, it, it has very, to me, very obvious ways that the sad song makes you sad and the happy song makes you happy. And that's what we're trying to get out of the kids when we say it. But I'm so struck that they sometimes have these, what seem like wild off the wall ideas about how the music uh, makes them feel. And I, I love that each one of those is uniquely valid and interesting, and it gives us a chance to talk about it, why that might be. And always you get the kid eventually who, who says the answer you were looking for. But I kind of love the, the, the wrong answers, not really wrong, but the, the different answers, the uh, unique and, and sort of the unique little insights into a kid's world <laughs> that's in the third row. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, what I, what I find really rewarding about camera about being a performer in the camera of Piccola productions is when you first open your mouth to sing the look on the kids faces you know because they have no they have no misconceptions about the art form they don't really know what it is necessarily um and they've never been you know within in, in the same small room as an opera singer in, in most cases um and to to hear a singer open their mouth and have this big sound come out um, is pretty powerful. And I think that we lose sight of that as adults and particularly adults within the operatic field that hear that all the time, you know? <laughs> you know, it, it's important not to take the operatic voice for granted. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful reminder when I see those, the, the looks on the kids' faces and uh, how it engages them, how, you know, there, there may be a din of the kids 
you know, talking and everything and it's loud and everything, but then the music starts, it's story time and uh, the narrator sings and all the kids just drop what they're doing, drop the conversation and, and listen and engage. That's uh, really powerful and-, and uh, Yeah, it's so fascinating because I think we all have this idea that kids just won't get it. Like, especially if it's, or even if it's in a different language, you know, that they just won't understand. But I think that discredits the fact that music is in fact itself a language. And like mm -hmm. Stan, like you mentioned with them, you know, sometimes coming up with these outrageous answers. And, and I think that's a really powerful thing too, even in terms of like, you know, bigger school structure, right? Because when in class, does it ever happen that you get to give the wrong answer? And someone is like, no, 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 that's not right. Let's figure it out and whatever. But that you can get to give a, a wrong answer and that someone goes, that is awesome that that's what you took out of it you know, mm -hmm. and that you're allowed to have whatever experience you had. And, and I think that's an important lesson, I think, in terms of learning how to appreciate art. Absolutely. Cool. So, um, so with all of these different things that are going on, um, let's talk a little bit about how you guys manage and run all of these different aspects it's like we've got this core of, of singers that are doing all these things but like what does the structure look like how do things get done so the eight of us split the uh, arts administrative duties up um you know and people have different strengths um we sort of leave it to to the members of of the artistic committee uh the the the, the sort of gang that is nco the eight of us um, to decide exactly how involved they want to be. We, we typically have um, different committees that mind things like the, the group's finances, um, the fundraising, these are very important things, of course. Um, and also the, you know, the production committee is a big beast of its own. There's so many detailed tales around um, uh, main stage productions, particularly as they, they continue to grow larger for us. Um, and uh, we have a, a committee around the children's opera, so the ball doesn't get dropped there. A, a committee around the uh, Camerata Works project so that no balls get dropped there, or hopefully we don't. And then the, in addition to that, whenever a, a project comes up on our calendar, um, we typically assign a point person to it. Within that, in a more broad sense, um, we each have our our positions within the company um, and the inherent things that we're responsible for um, from an administrative point of view. So um, for example, uh, our colleague Eva is a graphic designer. Uh, she has a degree in it. She is brilliant, <laughs> I think. Um, and she is our art director. So she takes everything into account to make sure that we have a nice cohesive uh, brand, uh, not only in terms of our graphic design, but also takes, you know, our copy for our promotional materials into account um, and the way that we present ourselves uh, online. So basically taking our skill sets from outside of the operatic world and applying them to the operatic world in ways that will be useful for the company and, uh, and, and get the job done. Yeah, and those are points too that I, you know, I'm glad to be talking to you guys because I think that, you know, we get this very pigeonholed idea of what it is to be an opera singer that, you know, it's, you have to be opera, opera, opera all the time. And that's just not a realistic um, idea anymore for, for most singers, for some, they can do it. But um, for a lot of us, you know, we've, we've had other work experiences. We've, you know, like you mentioned, Ava has a, a whole other degree or other projects that we've worked on. And so being an opera singer is not just a single thing so much anymore, but that it's part of like this whole person that you get to be that, that has a ton of different skill sets. And it's great whenever those other skill sets come together in service of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, for example, during the pandemic, I tried to stay as busy as I could in terms of opera, and I did a lot of singing, a lot of singing. It was great. Um, but what I did more than singing was editing, <laughs> video editing, uh, not only because uh, we, we released Julie, which was our biggest um, Camerata Works film to date, um, 
which we had filmed just prior to the pandemic. We, we wrapped in January, 2020. Um, but all the post-production was throughout the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and, but because both of the other uh, initiatives, the main stage and the, uh, and Camerata Piccolo uh, transitioned to fully virtual, it meant for, it meant made for a lot of editing. Um, and that was interesting. For example, we had we had our gala um, at Barbeau in Williamsburg uh, uh, last month, and it was really great. It was super enjoyable. Um, our first live in-person gala since before the pandemic, and um, we showed a what I was calling internally the gala resilience reel, which was just clips from all the things that we had uh, done since March 2020. We went all the way up until. Uh, November 2021, and we highlighted the gala <laughs> November 2021, and you know some it was it was pretty rewarding to see all the things that as an editor I could take pride in having a hand in in creating and and uh, in that reel, and then it was kind of meta because I was like, whoa, here's this this video that is that I edited of these videos that I edited, and <laughs> the audience. It, it, it manipulated them emotionally. I mean, touched them emotionally. I shouldn't say manipulated because, you know, we kind of got through the pandemic together in the context of this four minute reel. And it, it, they, they started applauding like about um, like 10 seconds before the end of the video, just because we got to the gala, we got to November, 2021. We made it, you know, through, through your support and with all of our, our, our NCO, you know, family audiences and, and friends and colleagues. And uh, that was a real tangible memory from that evening. And uh, I was, I, if I hadn't had been so steeped in video editing over the, the pandemic and just randomly, if that w weren't part of my life now because of NCO, then I would have never experienced that particular brand of, of satisfaction. So I'm grateful that, that NCO has given me that opportunity in a very roundabout way. <laughs> yeah, and also to, to continue the thought of, I think the age of, of super specialization is, is over. I, I think I, I went to school for a long time to study singing and, and um, continued that with, uh, with private teachers. And um, that's a great skill in my arsenal. It is not the only one. You know, and, and I think singers, a lot of singers have known this for a long time. If you're on Broadway, you should know tap and you should uh, have your acting chops together and you should be able to sing. And well, in opera, we have our version of that, which, you know, if you're a man and you're going to sing uh, certain styles of music, you should probably learn fencing, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different skills, but I would say that they are more and they're more important than they used to be. Like, I think... Um, wherever your path takes you in life, you're going to need to know how to do more things than you think. So never miss an opportunity to pick something up, to, to learn how to do it. You know, I've been trying to edit video as well, which leads to more headaches for Eric, but, but it's great. To, it's great to, um, it's yeah. great to add those things on. I mean, I, I never thought I'd be doing all of this stuff. I'm authoring grants and, you know, creating procedures um and and uh all in furtherance of a larger goal and and i mean that's the deal it, once i had the larger goal i really made it important to learn these other things and i would think you know if i were if i were younger and i had were told this i hope i would listen <laughs> to somebody who told me just pick up anything useful you you have no idea whether it's uh juggling or coding it, it, it'll come in handy somewhere um, and there is an inner, if what, if what you want to do is opera, there's an intersection for it someplace. If I had an opera singing code, you know, person with, with good computer code, I think we could probably really use them higher. Yeah. And we were <laughs> a, juggle, a juggler. Recently. Yeah. Also a juggler. We what definitely juggler need to think that right now. So. <laughs> That's, well, I'm sure the computer code opera singers are like not far away. I, I think there's, there's yeah, lots of those now, yeah. quite a few of those actually. Yeah. <laughs> 
Great. And so it's cool how all of these, you know, people in your core group are, you know, contributing all of their outside of opera experiences, if you want to call them that and contributing them to making great opera. Um, but that's just one level of your your structure, right? You also have like a larger board that you're mm -hmm. working with as well. Um, and so I'm just wondering how things work with, you know, going to them for different pieces of advice or what how they integrate into the system. So hey, people may not be too familiar. I mean, we weren't when we started. Uh, nonprofits need a board of directors and the board of directors is who we are responsible to. Um, so, so that is the, the formal structure. Now in practicality, we had a large hand in, in selecting those folks and um, they support our mission and they support us personally as well. So it's a very harmonious relationship. But it's good to keep in mind, in a very real way, uh, they're our boss. They're keeping their eye on the mission. They want to know what um, what our plans are and 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 how those uh, have to do with things. They also do some very important things. You know, in this company, we pay ourselves um, for uh, for the uh, production work that we do, but when, when, mostly for singing. We, we don't pay ourselves for very, very many other things, although we may be starting to, um, but we pay ourselves. And what we do need is a board that approves that uh, so that it's not a conflict of interest. And there are very real guidelines from the IRS that let us know what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do because we're asking people for money to support these things and not just people. I don't think they would care if we were ripping off people. They care that we'd be ripping off foundations and, and government entities, I think mostly. But uh, either way, they, 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 keep us, uh, they keep us straight if we were inclined to go crooked. Very early on, we identified that it was important to be a legitimate organization with a board of directors and to apply quickly for um, 501c3, which is a, a certification from the IRS that makes us a tax-free uh, deduction for folks. There are other ways that people start groups. They can start with, um, with a sheltering uh, organization, uh, Fractured Atlas is one of the biggest ones, but, um, and you can raise your money through an outside organization and they take six or 7% and then they give you the rest of it. Um, and that's an okay way to go. However, there's an awful lot of uh, um, philanthropic organizations, the larger ones that won't, won't look at you if you're in that sort of relationship. And there's a lot of foundations and government entities that have a harder time supporting you um, if you're not if you haven't put those uh, legitimizing wheels in place to have that board of directors that keeps you honest to to be jumping through all the hoops that the IRS uh, wants you to do. And so we identified very early on that we wanted that. Um, beyond that, we 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 want a board of directors that um, is focused. Uh, on the same sort of things that that we do, so we're always looking for new uh, board members. You know, and our board looks differently, I think, than more established uh, organizations. But but uh, we have um, a board that's more than fifty percent uh, women. We want a board that is diverse with people of various backgrounds, um, but who all love opera and who care about our mission. So it's a, a unique. Um, it's a unique position. Uh, we are always looking for uh, more talented, uh, wonderful folks to serve in that capacity. It's thankless. All we do is ask them for money and they have to do uh, things on our behalf, but somehow they, they love it anyway. And that's, that speaks to how wonderful they are as people. Very grateful to yeah. them. And also uh, we have, we're grateful to our advisory board, which is uh, not as prominently engaged as our, our board of directors is, but um, an incredible group of uh, people who offer us guidance um, and, and input into all the decisions that we make. Um, so that sort of the decisions that are the, the, the made by the democratic group that is the artistic committee are double vetted. You know, we have the board, you know, signing off on them. And then we also have the opportunity to go to the advisory board um, for, for their expertise. Wonderful. I love that it's like so many different levels of people who have so many different types of um, experiences and uh, and everybody on all these different levels just coming together to make something and it's wonderful that you've been able to find people that are you know 
in alignment with your goals that believe in the same things and that are helping to support you guys in in doing that yeah we're very grateful for for all that <laughs> for that very much yeah we don't take it for granted you know and it takes a lot of um work on their behalf and it take takes a, a lot of work for our group to to make sure that that identity uh, can stay in place but we're proud of it and and that board is is a big part of the reason why we can do so many good things. Well, guys, I know we have to wrap it up, but I just wanted to say if there's anything else you wanted to share, we could do it real fast. Otherwise, I guess we'd have to sign off and maybe we can all you know, come together and I'll see if people have some uh, comments. So we'd love if everyone would comment and let us know, you know what you thought of this uh, interview. If you have more questions that you'd like for us to address, maybe we could get together for a part two and, and dive a little bit deeper or have some more members of the artistic committee join us and, and answer some more questions. So if you guys want to hear more, um, just let us know. That's what we're here for. <laughs> no, thank you for, thank you for having us. This is a lot of fun to, to talk about. <laughs> yeah. And congratulations to you because your, your channel is wonderful. I've really enjoyed watching it um, over the last, I don't know, how long has it been? Almost a year? Over a year. Yeah. We started oh, well, last okay. August. Yeah. Wow. Well, Congratulations. It's really cool. And um, it's amazing um, to watch wonderful, creative people do wonderfully creative things. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, same to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. I really appreciate getting your, your input and letting everybody learn about what it's like inside an opera company in, 20, in the 2020s. <laughs> yeah. So, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Happy to be here. All right, that's what we have for today. Please be sure to comment and send us any of your questions that you might still have for Eric and Stan. I know I still have quite a few questions myself, so there's always the possibility of us getting to continue that conversation in the future. In the meantime, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, push all the fun buttons, including that little notification bell so you don't miss more great conversations and information in the world of classical vocal music. And we will see you next time. Bye. Do we have a problem, Eric? We keep talking about drinks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, priorities, we, 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 that's what they like.